I want to welcome you to Gardening in the Mountains, Gardening for All Abilities, Gardening for a Lifetime. Our speakers today are Mary Hugen Schmidt and Suzanne Wodak. They'll share with us today the biomechanics and ergonomic tools that will get us back into the garden and keep us gardening for life. Mary and Suzanne both completed therapeutic horticulture course offered through the Horticulture Therapy Institute and the University of Colorado and have training specifically to establishing therapeutic horticultural gardens at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Both Mary and Suzanne have ongoing practical experience helping with special gardening needs. They are co-chairs of our Extension Master Gardener Therapeutic Horticulture Program here in Buncombe County. And among their other projects, they work at the VA Community Living Center Healing Garden and the Psychosocial Rehab and Recovery Center. We are glad to have Mary Hugen Schmidt and Suzanne Wodek with us today to share that knowledge and experience. Take it away, Mary. Thank you, Allison. Suzanne and I are very glad to have all you folks here with us. We're going to be talking about gardening for all abilities. Gardening for all abilities in all ages has four major components, biomechanics, tools, garden design, and garden structures. Obviously, that's a little much for one hour, so we will be focusing on biomechanics and tools. We're going to start with biomechanics, which is the way you hold your body when you move. It's your posture and your alignment. It's extremely important because it helps to prevent fatigue, pain, muscle strain, sprain and tears, arthritis, restricted movement of muscles and joints, and falls and broken bones. It's a system that begins in the brain, travels the nerves down the bones to joints, muscles, and tendons. So all the parts of things that help us move. Now, research has shown us that physical exercise is very important, particularly as we age, both mentally and physically. It reduces the loss of flexibility and muscle strength. It reduces the risk of dementia. It reduces the risk of depression and anxiety, and it lowers your body mass index. It also increases your muscle tone and strength, your muscle flexibility, and improves your balance. So it is very important. Now the $64,000 question. When you come in from gardening, which part of your body hurts the most? Please put your answer into the chat. Allison, what comments do we have? What are folks saying hurts the most for them? Mary, the majority looks like back and shoulders. We have lower back, general back, knees, hip, elbows, and hands. The back, I think, is winning out here today. Well, they're right. Those comments are right on target with what physical therapists and doctors are finding from us gardeners. The two most sensitive spots are the back and the knees. What hurts tells you what you need to focus on in terms of your biomechanics. And with that in mind, let's go and talk about some exercises that can help reduce these problem areas. Now, the first thing is to get the kinks out and to keep them out. And this starts before you start gardening with a stretch. Now follow along with these 10 very short gardening warm-up exercises given by our very own Suzanne Wodick. We're out here in the garden, ready to get warmed up, ready to go with our exercises. We're gonna start with the neck exercise. Turn your head to the right as far as you can for five seconds. Then turn your head to the left as far as you can and hold for five seconds. Now repeat five times. Now for your second neck exercise, slowly bend your right ear towards your right shoulder and hold for five seconds. Bring your head up straight Slowly bend your left ear to your left shoulder and hold for five seconds. Repeat three to four times. Now we're moving to our shoulder exercise. Stand straight, 
clasp your hands behind your head and stretch your arms back. Hold for five seconds and repeat. This is your second shoulder exercise. Stand straight, bring your first arm across your chest. Use your second arm to pull it towards you. Hold the stretch for five seconds and repeat for the other arm. Now we're moving to the side bend. Clasp your hands above your head and slowly bend to the left, down towards the ground. Hold for five seconds and repeat on the opposite side. Okay, now we're going to do the trunk rotation. Sit in a chair with feet on the floor. Clasp hands together in front of you with arms at shoulder level. Rotate your upper body as far to the right as possible and hold for five seconds. Return to the center and repeat the exercise for the left side. Repeat five times. Now for your hand exercises. Relax your hands first. Okay. Hold your hand up. Now smoothly bend the end and middle joints of your fingers down, keeping wrist and knuckles straight. Return to starting position and repeat five times. You'll repeat with the other hand. Wrist exercises. Bend your wrist forward as far as you can and bring your wrist back as far as you can. Move your wrist back and forth five times. Repeat with the other hand. Now you're in for your hamstring stretch. You stand straight, place one foot on a step. Just put your toe up, just, oh, okay, right. yeah, okay. Keeping your back straight, lean your body forward at the hips. Returning to starting position and repeat five times. Repeat with the other foot. Stand straight. It's one foot on a step or in front of you, toe up. Keeping your back straight, lean the body forward from the hips. Return to starting position and repeat five times. You're ready now for your hip knee stretch. You're going to stand straight, bend one knee holding your ankle or foot and pull the heel toward your hip until the stretch is felt in the thigh. Hold this for four seconds. Repeat with the other knee. You'll notice that our model was using a chair. There's no need in having an accident and falling on your tush while you're doing your warm-up exercises. 
So make sure that your position is stable and that you are stable as you make the motions. You'll see that you have finished 10 exercises and they've taken about five seconds each and you've warmed up your body, you've loosened up your joints and your muscles, and you're ready to safely begin entering your garden. Now, a big reminder. Planning equals prevention. So before you set foot into your garden, spend some time deciding on the total time that you'll work in that garden today, and select the tasks that you feel you need to get done. Rank those tasks in order of importance, which one is bugging you the most and you want to get her done. Divide the tasks into 20 minute segments. Gather the tools you need and double check your own personal safety precautions. A quick personal safety check. Do you have your water? Do you have a phone or a timer and are they set for working periods of 20 minutes? Do you have good gloves? Do you have a wide brim hat where the brim comes out above the edge of your nose? If you put on your sunscreen, do you have your bug spray? Have you got good sturdy shoes that tie? Now, you may think this is overkill, but I'd like to give you a reality check. In 2016 alone, an estimated 118 million gardeners were in the United States. In 2017, ER reports from hospitals listed 400,000 injuries related to outdoor gardening tools, though frankly my favorite was from Britain where they recorded over 5,000 accidents due to flower pots. Experts have been giving us advice about all of this for quite a while. You need to watch the temperature as you work, depending on when you start particularly. You need to alternate your body positions as you work. Don't do one thing over and over and over. Protect your back, your knees, your shoulders, and your hands. Alternate your jobs. Do a different type of task every 20 minutes. In other words, don't spend your day pulling weeds alone. Alternate your pulling weeds with your transplanting with other activities that you will have. Take five minute water and stretch breaks every 20 minutes and have a place where you can comfortably sit in your garden. There's some injury hot spots for gardeners. The back, and it comes from bending, shoveling, digging, lifting, pulling. Your knees from kneeling and lifting. Your hands from pulling, digging, and lifting. Your wrists pulling, digging, lifting, and cutting. Your elbows and shoulders, take a look at this one. Pulling, digging, raking, shoveling, and lifting. So in other words, most of our garden activities affect certain parts of our body and we have to work hard to take care of those parts. Gardening doesn't have to hurt your back. This is a very informative video shared with us by Michelle Joyce and her website is listed below. It's really common after a day out gardening that you'll find that you have an aching back. And that's because gardening is full of bending and lifting and twisting and those are all posture traps, right? So we're going to make sure that we have some good posture while we're gardening and it's really going to minimize those aches and pains that you'll feel at the end of the day. So the most common thing that I see is people rounding their backs as they garden. They're just kind of sitting back and when they want to get closer to whatever they're doing, they round forward like this. And we know that whenever you round your back, whether you're sitting, standing, gardening or whatever, you're putting a lot of unnecessary wear and tear on your muscles. And so you want to have a nice straight back, a nice neutral spine whenever you can. And so what I'm going to do, instead of sitting back on my heels, I'm just going to lift up here so I can be on all fours with a nice straight back and do a little bit of gardening from here if I'd like. And that's protecting my spine much more than collapsing forward would. Now, another thing that you can do is you can use a small stool or a bucket as a little seat. So I'm just gonna sit on this. I have my legs 
nice and wide here so I can really hinge forward. And again, I'm able to just completely relax and get my get to my gardening here without rounding, staying nice and straight. And another thing that you can do if you have a little bit more flexibility in your hamstrings is to do just a standing forward hinge. So all I'm doing is I'm just keeping my knees not all the way locked out, they're a little bit soft, and I can just kind of go from here. I can support my hand and reach out over here, keeping my spine nice and straight as I'm doing that. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's really easy, especially when you're pulling weeds, to think, oh, I'm just going to twist over here and get these ones, or I'll just twist over here and get those ones. And all of that twisting, that repetitive twisting, is really going to put some wear and tear on your spine. So you want to make sure that if you're going to pull weeds over here, you don't need to twist your spine. Just move your whole body so that you're in an aligned position. One other thing that's very common uh, when you're gardening is that you're going to be lifting things, bags of dirt, flower pots, whatever. So when you lift something, it's the same idea. You want to keep your spine straight. So I'm going to, when I hinge down to pick something up, I'm bending from my hips are going backward. I'm not bending from my spine. And when I pick it up, I'm just going to lift from my legs, keeping that weight nice and close to my body. Good biomechanics, which you may remember from your mother, is stand up. You don't want to have a hump back. Your shoulders should be back and down. You should bend at the hips when you're weeding or planting. You should sit rather than bend your back. Square your hips and your shoulders to the shovel when you're digging. Lift with your legs, not your back. And never let your head be lower than your fanny, especially when you're lifting. The next most important thing is selecting and using well-maintained quality tools. Bend the tool, not the wrist. Use tools with angled or bent handles. Select lightweight tools where appropriate. Tool design should reduce excessive gripping or force. Length of the tool handle should be appropriate for your height. Consider lightweight power tools to avoid twisting fingers, hands, and wrists. So what is your favorite, most special go-to tool in your toolkit and why? Please answer in the chat. Allison, what were people's choices as their favorite tools and why? We have some tools being entered in to the chat. Knee pad, hand fork, several people put in a hori hori knife. Yes, <laughs> love uh, mine, yep. Long-handled weeders. A hoe with tines that are good for pulling weeds. Felco pruners, a trowel, pruners, 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 the hori hori knife, a battery powered weed eater, expandable handle, corona weeder, loppers, pruners, a cushioned seat that can also be used as a kneeling pad, long handled clippers. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper in the tools. One of the most important things to remember is that tools are a device that aid you when you're completing a task. And I think the quotation by Gertrude Jekyll here gets close to the heart because it enables us to connect what we're thinking in our mind and wanting to do in our mind with the job that we have to do for the plants that we are caring for. So without it, as Gertrude Jekyll says in her closing sentence, the brain and hand would be helpless without the tool to help us. We have a whole new world of tools out there. And what we're going to look at is ergonomic versus adaptive tools. Ergonomics is the science of tools and other related products to improve efficiency while reducing discomfort and risk of injury. 
So when you look at this tool, these tools are specifically designed with the idea in mind of protecting the worker who's using it, whether it is a tool in industry or a tool in our gardens. Adaptive tools, on the other hand, are tools that have been designed to do a job. We can make our own changes to a tool to fit the needs of ourselves, which means the changes are made to fit the needs of one specific user. Changes can be made both through commercial products and through homemade adaptations. Right now, what we're going to do is explore the wide variety of tools that are available to us and the wide variety of adaptations also available with some honest to goodness, real life garden tools out of honest to goodness, real life gardeners gardens. We're going to start with an ergonomic tool and you can recognize it by its signature circular handle. And if you look at the bottom here, you're going to see that it has very nice wide flanges so that when you're edging, which this is an edger, you get a good foundation and you can really drive the point of this tool into the ground. You'll notice that it's light. It's very, very lightweight, very useful. And this is one of the products that is available in a wide number of places. This tool, as you can see, does not have an ergonomic handle. However, you can see that it's lightweight. You can see that it has a nice wide flange. And if you look at the tip, you'll see that its tip is shaped to help dig deep and hard. And you can see that it's been used to do that. It has been worked. It is an, a very acceptable tool and in some cases might be an extremely handy tool for you in your garden. Now these look similar. Tell me the difference in these two. Mary. Well, if you see the, these two, you see first of all the difference is right here on the end. You'll see that it is a very, very narrow digging space. You'll also see that it has a very, very narrow place to put your foot. It also has a handle, a T-handle, and this can be a little difficult for some people. The beauty of this particular shovel is the size of this blade right here. Any of you who like to plant things, particularly bulbs, any of you that are into irises, this is your friend for life. Very, very handy. It's a teeny bit heavier than the others, but obviously not remarkably. I own this and I happen to know that it's very, very well made. It is very well made. Again, a little, little bit heavier than the others that we've had. But if you look at it, its shape will help you if you are digging into a space that you want a wide space that you're going to be digging up or digging into or preparing. If you're transplanting like a big flower or a bush of some kind, this is going to be your friend. You'll notice that its flange is smaller and is wide set out toward the end to give a lot of pressure on the outside of the blade. So where you need it to go deep into the soil. You'll notice that both of my hands fit here quite easily. Mary, this is one of my favorite shovels. And one Whoa. of the reasons I like this shovel is because it is small. I have some serious back issues and I'm used to using a big shovel and carrying a key lamp load of soil across the yard or digging a hole that's this big around. This reminds me to take smaller bites of soil. It forces me to take lighter loads and that is helping my back tremendously. This is a great shovel. I'm glad you brought it in. Thank you. Excellent. Most excellent. Now we've got some things that are going to be uh, helpful in getting the soil ready. Why don't you explain this one to us? This little gizmo has been around a long time and it has a lot of different names. It goes as weed weasel and other things. Any of you who have problems with your shoulders or your arms, using your hoe and you find your back hurts, this guy takes the place of the hoe, particularly if you are the kind of person that digs your weed. Some people scuffle their hoe and there's less pounding and vibrations on the muscles and joints. If you haven't let your weeds get as tall as you are, then something like this is very, very handy because all it does is to tear up the ground and tear up the weeds and chunk them up really, really well. So it's a, a handy thing if you're having problems with 
implements where you are digging with what's called the chopping motion that's going to send the vibrations up through your joints and your ligaments and your muscles. It's one of the reasons some of them get sore. Not familiar with this one, but boy, that looks very handy. This is a very handy little guy. It runs on a battery. If you look at the bottom, you'll notice it has wheels on it. These wheels can come down here so that when you're using it, you can actually, it's a, it's a weed eater, so that you can actually move it along like this, but you will be holding here. Did you see the difference between carrying the weight and lifting the weight? This is an incredibly light thing, as you can tell. I can even lift it over my head. So it's very light and very, very functional. It took the place of my big weed eater because the big weed eater was bigger than me and too heavy. So if you get to a point where you need to switch out a tool that you use a lot, then look and see what's on the market and what's available for you to substitute. I own one of these and it's one of my favorites. It's very lightweight. This is extremely lightweight and there are a whole bunch of different ones that if you look in the gardening catalogs and sometimes locally, they'll be in our garden stores. They're very, very handy. If you look at this blade, you'll see that it has three sides, basically three blades in one. The end would be used traditionally like a hoe, that you could dig out different weeds and things. This side, if you scuffle or take out your weeds that way, it could be used that way. This guy right here is very, very handy if you get into some tough weeds or you get into the vines or something of that sort. You may not see it, but these are curved. You'll notice that they're curved up so that when you get a hold of something that's like vining or trailing, you have a better grasp of that thing that you're trying to get out of there. And it comes from this side right here. So you've basically got a three-in-one tool that is extremely, extremely light. And if you use the different sides and the different blades, you can also reduce, again, the strain on your muscles and your arms. And if you keep your posture straight, you will also save your back. Speaking of the scuffle hoe, you keep talking about a scuffle hoe. <laughs> this is a scuffle hoe. The scuffle hoe just moves back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So this means that the motion that you're having is like this. You're not coming up and down and lifting and again, having vibrations in your joints and muscles. It's just really back and forth. This is actually an extremely old tool in terms of its history. It's been around a very, very long time and uh, it works really, really well. It also works really, really fast, which is something that many gardeners like. This one is not heavy. It's got a light little pole on it. Now for some breaking options. <laughs> now, any of you that have stuff that crawls underneath your flowers or your bushes and you've got to get under there to rake this stuff out, this is a, a handy little guy because he also can telescope. He also is, if you'll notice, very small. And if you're sitting and working, this is extremely handy. You don't have to worry about what to do with the rest of the pole that might go with a normal rake. It, again, is extremely light, very versatile for a lot of different things. Another very practical tool to keep in your toolbox. This is also a very ancient tool in, in my collection of tools, and I have loved it. What it does is you can make your rake big. It's very light. Or you can bring it down to the size that you might want. You can bring it all the way down from that big size all the way down to a very small size, which gives you one rake that can do quite a few different jobs in your yard. It is extremely light. It's aluminum, very, very light, very, very flexible. And as you can tell from looking at this poor old beat up thing, it lasts a long time. So this is another tool, depending on what your needs are, that would be very helpful for you. What we've got here is an ergonomic tool. It's a Cobra. And one of the things that confuse a lot of people, they think it's not ergonomic because it doesn't have the radius bent handle. However, what happened with this tool is the bend is in the actual blade of the tool. 
so that when you're holding this, if you can see, you've got a straight line up in your arm for your digging. You're not bending your wrist. And this is something that has been a little confusing for people because they equate ergonomic with the bent handle. Not all ergonomic tools have a bent handle, and the Cobra is probably the most famous of that group. I notice the orange tape. Oh, well, the orange tape is because my tools and I frequently become separated from each other as I'm working in the garden, and I have spent more time than I wish to make public trying to find tools that I have put down, moved on, and then had trouble finding. This is actually landscapers marking tape, easily available at Lowe's. And what I do is I put a color that really sticks out. If you'll notice, it has a slight bend. You'll notice it has good grips along the back. This is a Corona tool. You'll notice it's easy to hold and it's extremely sturdy. Now, if I start digging, I've got to be kind of careful because as you can see, if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, I can get myself in some, some trouble pretty quickly. And you can tell the part of my body that's going to be yelling at me when I get finished. So when you get a tool and you put it in your hand, try to run it through. If you're evaluating a tool to buy, run it through. How will you use it? What will your hand, if it's a hand tool, be doing? Because that will help you catch, is this going to work for you or not? It's an excellent tool, absolutely excellent tool, but depending on your own personal anatomy, it might not be the best tool for you, and you have to make that decision. Now, if you notice this one, it does not have an ergonomic shape, and you'd think, well, well, what about that? Well, the what about that is balanced out here. If you will notice the shape here of this part of the tool, it's a soil scoop. And that means basically you're going to be digging and getting it and getting the soil out and doing something with it. And if you notice, if you do the same thing with this, as I was showing you with the other, the Corona, you'll see that it has some actual strengths, even though again, it's not curved. It does have things to help you, and they're right in here, to keep yourself balanced as you're using this tool. It's very lightweight. It's a very lightweight tool and very functional for its purpose, which is as a soil scoop. Speaking of lightweight, that's very lightweight and very inexpensive. I bought those for kids in the garden. We've used this extensively in workshops and things we've done in senior centers, in nursing homes with kids. So this is a wonderful tool and absolutely light. It is industrial strength. It's short of running over it with a semi or something. I don't know much that breaks in this particular tool. This one is particularly nice because on the inside, it has gradations and it has the inches. So if you're using it as a planting tool, which we often do in our workshops, then you can see quickly where your person is supposed to dig to. It's very, very helpful. It also comes in different sizes. There, are, there is a larger size as well. So it comes in different sizes, easily available at Walmart or any Home Depot, Lowe's, all that sort of thing. Excellent. And if you've got grandkids, <laughs> perfect. Whoa, this is amazing. Tell me about that one. I'm going to ask John to say a few words about this one. This is John's tool. And this is an amazing tool if you are digging holes and I assume planting things, right, John? I'm gonna pass to you. Yes, this is just an auger. They call it a soil auger and it's on a drill. This is a red, but any good drill would work. You use it for drilling holes. I like this one because it's long and I can get down here and drill two or three or four inches deep with this without having to do a great deal of bending, 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 or getting up and down off the ground. You can walk around and drill a series of holes where you're planting bulbs. This is large enough for a typical bulb. It's also large enough for a typical two inch transplant. It makes a lot less wear and tear on my back. You can get shorter versions of this, which might be a little bit stronger, but if you do, you're going to be down on the ground with it. And I like this one because I can work it from up top without having to bend over. So this is a great tool. The one thing you have to watch out for on these is that if you happen to catch a root under that giant oak tree, it will jerk the handle and it can be kind of hard on your wrist. 
So the trick is go fairly slowly, go gently down, don't try to rush and go boom, 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 because that's when you're likely to get a root and get a lot of torquing up there. So there is some caution involved here today. I don't have to warn you on that, but it certainly is a back saver. Okay, now, Mary, we have some pruners. Let's, let's talk about those. What we have here is a very nice set of pruners. And what you'll notice is this is going to be something that's used frequently for pr pruning bushes and trimming things. What you want to look at when you select yours is you want to look at what happens to your hand and your arm as you are doing this because this motion here is repetitive. Whenever you're dealing with a tool where you've got a repetitive motion, you need to remember that that is going to be something that can easily cause you discomfort. But if you'll notice some things about this pruner, if you'll look right here and you look at the bottom now that it's all wide open, do you notice that there is a curve on the top and a curve on the bottom with a little lip that comes down here? Now, what that means is when you put your hand here, your little finger comes over here. And so what you've got is a little extra help on this as you're working. And this one is working quite well. So you want to just keep an eye on the small things. What does it feel like in your hand? How does it move? Is it hard to squeeze? For instance, this does have a resistance here, which all clippers have to help with the cutting. So if that's a really tight spring in there, you might want to consider a different tool. This one doesn't, but if you were to pick up one to try, and it did, you would probably be advised to try some more. It's a very handy tool, very functional tool. Now you probably wonder what this is. What this is, is the handiest of little tools for clipping, trimming, like deadheading, that sort of thing, on things that are not woody. Now, if you've got something that's woody, this is not your tool. But if you have, don't have something that's woody, it's very, very helpful and moves very, very fast. Now, if you look at this, you will see nothing is happening down here. These fingers aren't going anywhere. The person who's doing all the work is this thumb. Now, what that says to you is if one part of you is doing the work with a tool or the heavy lifting, as some people say, then you want to watch and make sure you don't get carried away and end up very stiff and sore in one particular part. So that's the only caveat I have with this little guy is you do need to watch that. Otherwise, he's a good friend. Now, here's another good friend. This is a Corona saw. If you look at this, you say, well, yeah, it's, it's got a curve in it. You look at it and you say, yeah, it fits in the hand really well. Some people might choke, some people might carry it back depending on your style. But the beauty of this particular saw is, first of all, it is extremely sharp. The second part that makes it wonderful for us is that it saws in both directions. So as you are working, your saw is actually making two cuts for you. And this means that there's less resistance as you are pushing and pulling because once you've started it, it's literally in a groove and working for you. It's very, very lightweight, very well balanced. So you can use it a lot of different ways with your pruning. And really, I'd never seen it before, but I love it. <laughs> I think it's really great. It's the kind of tool you want to be looking for. It will not be marked maybe ergonomic, but does it meet the needs that you have as a gardener? And does it help you do an activity without undue strain on the body parts that are going to be in there working the hardest? John, this is your tool. What do you like about Why would you want a folding tool? Well, I will tell you why I would want one. Basically, it preserves your tool. If you wipe it off and do like this, first of all, it preserves your tool. It keeps it from being nicked, banged, boo-booed, and that sort of thing. The other thing it does is it preserves you because if this thing in the blade is open and you reach in to get something, if you're carrying it around in your tool bucket or if it's hanging on your wall in the garage or whatever, if you reach for something in the vicinity of this tool, if that blade is out and you're not attentive, you could have a little accident. So it, that's one of the safety features of this particular tool and one of the things I like best about it. This one, you'll notice there's no bent handle, is a hoary knife. 
it's been around a long time. This is a tool that is really very handy if you're working down and close in the soil, and it works in almost every kind of soil. It's very handy because, again, of the size of its blade. And you'll notice it has a side here with a chopping kind of side that you can use. So if I'm down there and I've gotten to a point in my roots and I'm thinking that pretty soon I'm going to be hearing Chinese, then I can take this side right here and I can saw roots. I can get down a level where sawing them off will be helpful in getting rid of the plant. So this is a good tool for planting, for doing pots, just all kinds of things that come up. It's just one of those multi-purpose little guys it's handy to have around as an alternative for you when you're particularly planting or you're thinning out. We used it the other day in the plant thing because we had this big clump of comedium that there was no way we were going to be able to pull that apart. I reached for this and we were able to cut that epimedium into smaller pieces and that worked really well. One of the things a lot of people get to the point when they need a little help with their tools in terms of being able to lift a tool or to hold a tool and they think that their special tool that they love and they've had and they want to keep is gone for life and there are moments of great sadness. We've talked about ergonomically designed and built and produced commercially. There are other things you can do with the tools you already have. Because we live in the mountains, all of you know what this is. This is the stuff that goes around your pipes to keep your pipes from freezing in the winter time. You can take any garden tool. If your grip is getting to the point that it is slipping on you, or you're tiring, or you're getting a pain in your wrists or hands or shoulders, then you just slip this over, put it down where you would hold that tool. You'll put it down wherever it is that you are holding that tool. And when you get it to the place where you would normally hold the tool, a little bit of duct tape around it in three places, and you're good to go. You've got your tool back and working for you again and comfortable. Now, if what you really need is something with the lift, this is particularly true if you develop shoulder problems or upper back problems. There are commercial items on the market, and this is one of them. And all you do with this is you, let's see if I can get it so you can see, there are two screws in here. And all you do is undo your screws. You then slip this part down your handle, tighten up your screws, and you're ready to go. And you put it where you will be using it to lift when you are working. This works on any tool with a rounded handle, which is most of them. Now, a bigger one, and this is one that comes in two parts. This is longer because sometimes the lift does not need to be to the top of your comb. It needs to be more toward the bottom. If that's the case, then this guy right here comes in. It has two parts. You slip one part on, thusly. You put this part into it. Whoops, excuse me. This part into it. And what you have then is the ability to lift lower down, which reduces the strain, particularly on your back and particularly on your lower back. These are called adaptations. And this means that you've taken a tool that is yours, that you have used and you know, and you've made that tool work better for you. There are quite a few of these on the market right now. Once upon a time, they were only available through medical people who worked with people who'd had different kinds of accidents, but now they're commercially available. I think all of us are, have seen the garden kneelers for years. In this case, it's particularly important for your knees because the first place for most gardeners for accidents, injuries, and problems to develop, believe it or not, according to both physical therapists and doctors, are the knees. So first of all, this protects your knees if you're down working close to the ground. Secondly, it protects you. If you freeze up or you get too tired, then you've got some way to stand up. If there's nobody around to help you, this is an important thing to know. What you have here are handles on either side that you can use to put yourself up. And this is extremely well balanced. You will not tip yourself over. If you push straight up, there you go. 
and you're safe. Now, if you flip it, if you flip it, then you are able to sit and work. But when you do that, you have to remember your back and your shoulders and your alignment. So when you're there and working from the seated height, just make sure that you're keeping your shoulders back, your shoulder blades down, your back straight as you are working. You do not want to make the hump. So be careful about that. That is something that can keep you safe and active in the garden, as well as letting you do those chores you want to do, even though your body may be saying, I'm not so sure about this. Looking at what we've done here today with the tools, there are several points I hope you got. One is that a tool does not have to be ergonomic all the time. You can have tools that are not ergonomic, that because of the way you use them and the way they are constructed, they're perfectly okay. You should also be aware of what makes a tool ergonomic and how to look at it and to test it for yourself to see if it's ergonomic for you. I will tell you a personal story. When the radius tools came out, you've probably noticed my hands and wrists, I have rheumatoid arthritis, and I thought that those were going to fix everything, and I bought myself a complete set, all four. A radius tool was one of the very first ergonomically commercially available garden tools in the United States. It has the famous curved handle. They are wonderful tools. They were not wonderful for me and my arthritis, and it came as a shock because I hadn't tried the tool when I bought them. It was a shock that I had bought them and that they didn't fix everything. Number two, make sure you try and just move as you might move in the garden the tool to see how that works for you. The third thing is that tools that you have now can be adjusted a variety of different ways so that they meet something that you need. For instance, if you need a little help with the heft of what you're lifting or what you're raking, if you need to take a little stress off of your shoulders, so you can add things to your tool that makes it functional for you. And the last thing is that this is all changing. It's different for different people. It's different for different types of gardens. It's different for different types of gardening. So it's the kind of thing that nobody can tell you this is the way it should be done. What you have to do for yourself is to analyze, experiment with, and try out things to see what works best for you. And make sure that you're keeping your ergonomics in place and that you're practicing good self-care techniques when you're in the garden to minimize accidents, keep yourself well, and follow the rules that you know you should be following. We've reviewed the biomechanics of gardening that keep us well and safe. We've looked at warm-up exercises that help us get prepared for an accident-free time in our garden. And we've looked at ergonomic and adaptive tools that help us preserve our own health and our ability to continue gardening for a very long time. In addition, we have some references. One is a list of sources for tools, ergonomic and otherwise. The second is the warm-up exercise description that Suzanne demonstrated for us. And the third is a bibliography. For those who want to dig deeper into practical aspects of gardening and changes you can make to make your gardening time more functional, safer, and more pleasant. We hope that you've enjoyed this session. Suzanne and I have enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Thank you both so much and John for helping make this program work for us today. We want you to know about our next Gardening in the Mountains on Monday, April 19th. We have a program on planning and growing a botanical dye garden. And then our Saturday seminar for April 24th will be on wood pallet and straw bale gardening. Those programs are posted on the Master Gardener website, which is bunkamastergardener.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we wish you well in the garden and safe gardening.